Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jorge Martinez. I'm Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, John Bracken. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Welcome. We're going to slowly begin to talk as we see you begin to filter in. Um, you know, this, I think, is a really um, interesting time to be having this meeting. Um, and this is a really important community, you know, speaking on behalf of Digital Public Library, which, which I help run. I have the privilege of helping to run. And I think if I can be so bold, George, to speak to you and our friends at Knight Foundation, the, the, through George's and Knight's leadership for the better part of the last 12 or 13 years, Knight has been bringing together many of you here in person in Miami, usually in February, uh, where we're usually you know, helped by music and, and lovely food and, and the presence, the physical presence with one another. To, to be spurred by Knight Foundation to have conversations about what is the role of our field, what's the urgency for our field to ensure our vitality and, and continued uh, centrality of libraries and historical memory organizations like museums to, to 21st century American democracy. Um, and like many of you, you know, George, the DPLA and Knight have been in conversations uh, over the last year, but how do we do this? How do we keep this vibe going during this, this interesting time? I think speaking on behalf of DPLA, um, you know, one of the lessons of the last year is the urgency of our work, the centrality of our work, and the need for us to be even more robust in how we're thinking about um, digital, digital, digital in terms of driving our, our work, right? I mean, it was striking to me and so many of you experienced this directly, and I benefited from listening to a lot of you, how your digital work, our digital work, which had been maybe a sidecar or a tail, became the dog for much of 2020, and indeed for many of us throughout, for much of 2021. Um, I think second, the experience of this last year, since we were all together as a community in Miami in, in 2019, I guess in 2020 rather, um, has been a greater realization that we need to center and address racial and geographic disparities in access to resources, access to information, the national crisis, right, in terms of access to quality information and healthcare and job availability and job education. And even just the, you know, the, what we all experienced in the visible disparities into access to classroom experiences, I think all brings home the centrality of a lot of what we talked about the last time we were together in February of 2020. Um, yeah. No, that's You're great, John. In. Yeah, <laughs> I was trying to. Thank you, John, that's great. Um, you, know, I, you know, before we go any deeper, sort of want to remind folks, you know, Knight Foundation, we're a national foundation with strong local roots in 26 communities around the US. Our mission has always been to create more informed and engaged communities. So in the words of our founder, John S. Knight, these communities can determine their own true interests. You know, we believe that an informed citizenry requires freedom of expression, that a community can only be truly engaged if it's equitable and inclusive. Now, to me, when I hear all these words, uh, you know, the public library just pops into my mind. I mean, no place screams out informed and engaged more than the public library these days. You know, they're inclusive and open to all. Uh, you know, one of the best expressions I heard many years ago was from Pat Lazinski at a gathering at democracy, that libraries are democracy's best kept promise. That's a fabulous expression. This is why Knight Foundation supports the work of libraries, you know, mainly as digital centers of excellence in their communities where residents you know, engage and socialize with new technologies. They increase their awareness of not only what's happening around the world, but more and more these days, what's going on in their own communities. And they develop new skills and competencies. They are vehicles for trusted information in our communities. And Knight really supports libraries as these innovative and engaging community spaces. So, you know, as John mentioned, our approach has been to support these knowledge exchanges over the years meetings like this that we've been holding for the last 12 or 13 years. Knight invest in libraries, mainly in our communities, around key areas of opportunity. 
Now it's, you know, as John said, it's been an unreal 13 months since we last held the meeting in person in Miami. And what we've seen is the pandemic has really driven home the need for ubiquitous, reliable- 16, 16 months, 16 months, but who's counting, George? Has it been 16? I thought it was last, no. Almost 17. No, no, well, whatever, it's, it's Miami, the heat. Uh, you know, the pandemic, like I said, has really driven home the need for access. And especially in today's world, you know, our president, Alberto Ibarguen always said, it, you know, unfortunately, if you don't have reliable, good high speed internet access these days, you, you know, you, you really risk being marginalized, uh, almost a second class citizen. And we just can't accept that today. So it's really fortuitous that so much of today's meeting will be about this very topic. And you know, like John said, we've all been living virtually these days. It's all been about Zoom or Teams or whatever. We've all become comfortable with this you know, amazing technology that we've had there for years, but we really were forced to adapt to this. And the good thing about it, if anything, uh, that has come out of this, you know, one of my regrets every year is we have these wonderful conversations, great gatherings, but then sort of a year would pass between meetings again, you know, it's at the night convening and the opportunity to keep these conversations and relationships going has always been somewhat, you know, to me, a disappointment, a, a lost opportunity. I see that now that not only virtual, but I think more and more hybrid meetings in the future where not only hold meetings together in person, but, you know, always include people from the outside more and more and not just include them as viewing, but really engage them uh, is going to be where we're moving to. So I see us having these at least sort of mini gatherings every three to four months moving forward until we get back together once a year, again, hopefully in person, probably a combination of in person and folks who aren't there in person, you know, joining us remotely. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from all of you. You know, you're all great leaders in your field. You really understand what's going on there. You know, you have your pulse on what's happening in your communities and seeing what other new fantastic opportunities arise. And like I mentioned, we, we hold these discussions around these important topics. And sometimes these conversations actually lead somewhere. And I don't know if many of you remember last year, there was a great conversation with, uh, with John and also a colleague of ours, Tony Marks from NYPL and Michelle Kimpton from DPLA around some of these topics around how libraries can better deliver digital assets to their patrons. So today I am really thrilled to announce a $5 million award that Knight has made to Lyricis with the goal of creating a library driven ebook platform and marketplace that makes it possible for libraries to evolve their work in the digital age, to communicate better and to sort of be in more direct relationship with their patrons around the delivery of these assets and technologies in their local communities. So hopefully, is uh, Robert and Michelle on yet? Justin? Michelle, there we here. are. Come on, come on stage with us, you two. Welcome, Robert. Welcome, Michelle. Hop so up. I'm really thrilled to introduce you to the CEO of Lyricist, Robert Miller. I'm sure many of you know, to sort of talk about the, you know, his vision of Knight's Award and also to hear from Michelle uh, her vision for, for working on this project as well. So folks, welcome Good. Love to hear from you. Great. George, quick sound check. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Robert. Excellent. So Jorge, George, uh, since working with you since July of 2020, I've not only gotten a better sense of Cuban culture, uh, but I've come to appreciate your deep convictions about the impact public libraries can have on their communities and the patrons they serve. As John was highlighting, you truly are our champion. As the $5 million award to lyricists, and I can't wait to get to the end to talk about Michelle, I wanna uh, offer a public thank you. To spark digital community engagement between our public libraries and their patrons is a noble and wonderful opportunity. So on behalf of the team at Lyricists, we're honored. Uh, George, you've given me a high bar to meet. You know, as you know, professionally, this is not my first large scale software and content rollout. As CEO of an Israeli and US technology software content driven company, we focused on delivering and democratizing healthcare information for consumers. We successfully delivered a web-based solution with a sizable investment from a large funder. 
More recently and prior to Lyricist, we used a significant foundational investment. If Doran's online, thanks Doran from Sloan, to build a nonprofit team that ultimately included 600 staff, over 100 public libraries, including Jill Bourne, I know you're gonna be speaking later, and other content contributors to build a non-paywalled, mobile, sustainable, uh, sustainably public library used by 330 million, 330 million people a year. So George, you told me I have to beat those goals. So what I learned out of that, there were two opportunities. Uh, these two opportunities, there were three key things that need to be in place to build a sustainable enterprise quality and community involved solution. It takes leadership, teamwork and organization along with passion and drive. For those that don't know at Lyricist, we have an experienced field tested team who engage, manage and lead and support 10 national and global software and content programs. We currently have over 1800 libraries of all stripes and a long history of working with public libraries. Teamwork in this program, our large and experienced team has been working really closely with DPLA and NYPL for two years to blend each institution's expertise together. John, it's been a real pleasure to get to know you better and I'll be looking forward to working with you and the team at DPLA in the future. Thanks so much. Organization drive and passion, and this is where I wrap up. At the end of the day, it's the people who create the success, George, as you well know. To deliver on the challenges outlined in the investment from night, I've created a division inside of Lyricist. And this will allow us to apply and leverage our Lyricist nonprofit formula for success of all public libraries. This division will allow us to apply not just the night resources, but also a multi-million dollar internal Lyricist investment to build the appropriate community support, relationships with the public libraries, foundations, and content providers necessary to deliver a sustainable, seamless and experience. You'll hear about that, about that for a second, Michelle. This patron-based solution is gonna have a lot of technology, but it's also gonna have content that spans a broad range. As my board member, Dr. Rhea Lawson from Houston Public Library says, Robert, if this investment can help the public library be the center of our community's digital creative engagement, I'll be so pleased. So in conclusion, I'm pleased to announce that this Lyricist division will be run by Michelle Kimpton, formerly of DPLA. I've worked with Michelle for over 10 years. She's talented, collaborative, creative, and gets things done. She formerly was my chief strategy officer at Lyricist. She left Lyricist to join DPLA and really helped organize and spearhead the move Simply E into library simplified program forward, in many cases, to where it is today. I'm so pleased she's returning to Lyricist, where she'll work closely together as global director of the Palace Project. Michelle will build and lead her team internally and work externally with the various stakeholders. Michelle, I couldn't think of a better person. And now I'm gonna turn the conversation over to you. Thanks so much. Thanks Robert and John and George. I'm really thrilled to be leading this effort that ultimately is gonna bring more content, more diverse content, more open content to public libraries and in ways that libraries can further engage with their patrons in the digital space so much like they do in the physical space. If we can create an engaging and passionate way in the digital space, that would be, that would be really important. And particularly given that that is the only way we were able to interact with each other over the last 16 months. Some of you may or may not know, Lyricist and DPLA have actually been working together strategically over the last four years on this project in not the Palace Project, which we're launching today, but really the foundational elements of the Palace Project. So it's really great. And I feel so proud of all of us that Knight has endorsed this partnership, has endorsed our work and is ready for us to accelerate the work. Um, just super fantastic. So I could not be happier working with both organizational teams my former colleagues at DPLA, my current colleagues at Lyricist, and believe it or not, we work together seamlessly. We have a hybrid team, the Palace Project team, that includes colleagues from both organizations, and they are just so fun, smart, motivated, and mission-driven to serve public libraries and their patrons. So with that, I am so inspired by all of them that we are only gonna do good things together. And I'm just gonna leave you with you know, one uh, quote, which is from Eric Kleinberg, which are, which well, not a quote, but the way we came up with the Palace Project was really inspired by Eric Kleinberg that basically said that libraries are the palace for the people. And we wanna make sure that we have a project that is completely inclusive for everybody and everybody feels that they have some nobility. So with that, 
I want to thank again Knight and George in particular that are making this happen for us. Well, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, really excited to see what comes out of this um, investment by Knight Foundation. It is exciting. And I'm hoping that next time we get together and discuss this, there'll be more fantastic news to hear from you all. And I also want to take a moment to, you know, I, I think we've all mentioned it before, but really a lot of this is building on the work that NYPL, Tony Marks and his team there began with Library Simplified um, and Simply E, that this is really sort of making it more of a turnkey, or the goal here is to make it more of a turnkey solution for libraries that, you know, the hosting and uh, all the components are taken care of, including sort of access to content, you know, through DPLA exchange or through other, uh, other vendors. And it's uh, really exciting opportunities for libraries to, to engage their local patrons in new and interesting ways. So Mr. Bracken, what's next for us? Well, I don't want to be left out just to kind of give the group high five to, you know, our, our uh, once and future collaborators and partners at Lyricist to my, you know, comrade in arms, both first within DPLA and then outside of DPLA, Michelle Kimpton, uh, and our partnership with Knight. So this is really exciting. Uh, I do also want to undergird, since you already thanked my other funders, George, I also want to just really acknowledge, you know, Sloan Foundation for enabling DPLA to do this work at all. As, and I guess, Robert, you shouted out that as well. So thank you, Sloan Foundation, for your support to DPLA over the years. And I think we, you know, IMLS really, you know, with the federal funder, which actually, we're going to be joined by Crosby later as part of my segue to the later discussion, um, enabled this work to get off the ground back in 2013 in the first place and actually supported work and was at the table as we formulated this collaboration, this project and proposal together. So thank you to, to Crosby and the entire, James and the entire team at, at IMLS. Um, and um, shoot, there was another aspect of the work that we're growing that I wanted to, to touch on, but it's super, from a DPLA perspective, we're so excited. It allows us to really step on the gas and the combination of both the investment and the imprimatur that we're, we're building a future for libraries. We're not looking to the past and we're um, addressing the opportunities and gaps that have become particularly more clear over the last over the last year. So uh, go team, it's gonna be exciting. You know, there's a, over the coming days and weeks, we're all three of us, all four of us and our team are here at the table to answer questions about what's coming next and how we're gonna do the work. The answer to a lot of those questions I'm anticipating is gonna be, we don't know yet. We're still figuring that out. Help us figure that out. So we hope that the you know, this is only going to succeed to the extent that it's a community collaboration. We're all as a field taking this forward to the next level. And uh, it's really exciting. So DPLA is really excited to be, be part of this and appreciative to Knight Foundation, IMLS, and Michelle uh, for being at the center of this with us. Thank you, John. And what's that ancient all uh, right. proverb? The journey of a thousand miles begins with the first app. So the 21st century version of yeah. it. So looking forward to yeah. uh, the first product that comes soon. Yay. So we'll, you know, more, more to come soon. Um, so I, I think we're at the point at Robert, Michelle, any last, any last words and we'll, before we bring up our next group, go team. Just the site uh, is live at thepalaceproject.org, all one word. Just there is more information on there if you want to see, but a lot more information to come. Fantastic. So, you know, I guess I realize we were doing a lot of talking about um, this community of libraries that we've built. And I realize as I'm looking at the list, a lot of you have not been in this room with us before, which is great. It's part of the reason we're excited to leverage the digital channel to, to, to convene. Um, you know, I, I do want to share that as we were talking about this meeting, we had one set of expectations uh, and we were preparing to do some programming, you know, related to, you know, I guess we, we decided to take advantage of uh, George's boss, Alberto, who we'll be hearing from soon, put out a call, a challenge in another meeting that we were in um, saying, uh, subtly emphasizing that we are at a moment where 
there's a national focus on the urgency around access to broadband. Um, and let's not, as libraries, we need to take advantage, and supporters of libraries, we need to take advantage of that moment. So we shifted and focused this meeting on that. Um, throughout the day, we're going to hear from a set of folks really exciting, both at sort of a national funder level um, and at a place-based implementation level. And we'll be closed out for the day by, by Tracy Hall, the executive director of the American Library Association, who's been exploring this topic with us, and John Palfrey, who among his hats is a board member at Knight Foundation, the found, a founder of DPLA, and the author of Bibliotech, a book about libraries in the digital age. Um, um, you know, and I guess I, I just to link from the previous announcement to the conversation that Andrew is going to help take us through with with our colleagues. Um, what, you know, for those of us, I know a lot of us, including this panel, some of the of the people on this panel, have been working on questions. And George and Knight Foundation have been working on questions of access, broadband access, for you know two, in some cases, three decades. And I think if there's one lesson. I've taken away from some of those conversations is that talking about broadband in, in the abstract as just pipes does not get us the progress we need to have. And that the reality that, it, it, so, at, so at the center of civic conversation today about what the, the risk to the country of gaps to broadband, right? And the risk to the country if we don't lean into the ALA's proclamation that access to broadband is a human right. Is, is, is dire. Um, and if we want things like the Palace Project to succeed and the quality content built by and from and curated by libraries, if folks aren't able to access it, we're, you know, or if they're just able to access it and don't have access to the quality content, we're only, we're only getting half the pie. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to my friend and colleague, Andrew McLaughlin, who's been at the center of these convenings in recent years. Um, among Andrew's hat is the board chair at Access Now, um, the co-chair of the Brooklyn Public Libraries Digital Strategy Committee, which a part, key partner of ours, um, and I guess relevant for this, among his other identities for this conversation, a former deputy CTO in, in the White House, um, in, in a prior administration, but I'll say not the most recently prior administration. <laughs> Andrew, over to you, my friend. Thank you so much. Is my, uh, is my audio okay? Everybody can hear me all right? Um, great. So uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, there's a kind of symbolic significance to this uh, meeting. The, 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 uh, I think the last trip that I took pre-pandemic was to Miami for the uh, night gathering, night libraries gathering uh, in 2020. Uh, and, and now uh, I'm literally on my first uh, business trip post-pandemic uh, right now. So it feels like uh, there's a kind of like bookending uh, nature to this. But I do want to say that what, uh, what happened in between from the standpoint of internet connectivity was an absolute crisis, an underappreciated and devastating crisis for an extraordinarily, extraordinarily large number of Americans. Um, and once again, uh, we see the public libraries uh, stepping up uh, to meet that crisis uh, and to ameliorate the um, effects of lack of broadband connectivity on uh, students, patrons of all stripes, uh, libraries serve their communities um, uh, in uh, 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 myriad ways, but one of the most crucial over the last uh, uh, year and a half has been providing that uh, uh, endpoint connectivity uh, to uh, high-speed internet uh, for homework, for work, for uh, services, um, for information, and so forth. And um, I will just say, I think one of the uh, experiences I had in the Obama administration, uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and name it, uh, was uh, the, the BTOP program in 2009, 2010. We cooked up $7 billion for uh, uh, programs through the Department of Commerce and the Rural Utility Service that was largely devoted towards middle networks. In other words, trying to expand the backend pipes for broadband connectivity in the hopes uh, that uh, uh, they would reach institutions like the libraries um, uh, and uh, uh, competitive ISPs um, to try to open the market up and introduce uh, competitive dynamics. Looking back on it now, I think it was clearly a success, but uh, in a world in which 30% of students in cities, as much as 50% of students in uh, uh, rural areas, uh, and even greater numbers of students on uh, reservations or um, in uh, uh, underprivileged communities, communities of color and so forth, uh, lacked broadband access, 
uh, it's something that uh, I, I think we are only beginning to understand the effects of, um, and they are not good. So what we're hoping today to talk about is strategies that libraries are bringing, would like to bring, can bring to the table. I'll just say one last note before I introduce our panelists and kick it over to them, which is I've been working uh, with the Brooklyn Public Library team to try to figure out how to tap new rounds of funding. And uh, honestly, like, I don't know how you all do it. The rules are so dumb. I can't even begin to express how annoying bureaucratic and counterproductive the rule structure for the distribution of these funds is. But anyway, we'll all get through it. Let's now talk about what to do uh, with newly available streams of funding with existing infrastructures and with the dreams that our uh, panelists have uh, for their institution. So um, I will introduce, uh, I'll just mention uh, the panelists. Um, I'm just gonna go in alphabetical order by last name um, and uh, we'll hear from everybody's, uh, hear from everybody uh, and then, um, uh, I will interrogate and uh, uh, we will do some Q&A. So um, uh, our panelists today are Jill Bourne, the city librarian for the San Jose Public Library, Juliet Fink Yates, the digital inclusion fellow at the city of Philadelphia, uh, Jenny Stapp, the Montana state librarian, uh, and Felton Thomas Jr., the director, uh, director of the Cleveland Public Library. So Jill, over to you. Hi, thank you. And uh, good morning on the West Coast. Uh, good afternoon to everyone else. Um, as, uh, as was said, I'm the city librarian in San Jose. I'm gonna give a little bit of background about how uh, the library got involved and where we're at right now in this question. Um, so we all remember back to March, 2020, our city was shut down as a result of the pandemic and a countywide order to immediately shelter in place. So while the digital divide in San Jose had already been studied and prioritized in years just prior to the pandemic, the sudden shutdown of our critical in-person services citywide and countywide quickly clarified that the ability to connect digitally had become an urgent, essential human need necessary for almost every aspect of life, uh, you know, access to education, work opportunities, healthcare, housing, counseling, psychological support and services and so on. Um, and existing inequities were quickly exacerbated by both the pandemic and the lack of digital access, resulting in deeper impacts to our communities by income and communities of color. So the city's response was to create a digital inclusion branch of our emergency operations center initiated in April 2020 to respond to those urgent needs of residents to be digitally connected. And the library was designated as the lead of a cross departmental effort, which includes the city's information technology department, uh, the city manager's office of civic innovation, public works, and um, even our parks and recreation. 13 months later, the digital inclusion emergency effort has transitioned to an ongoing citywide digital equity priority so that we can build on the momentum of that emergency work and implement an ambitious work plan with both immediate and long-term goals. So while it might seem a little surprising to have the library in this role, which was originally admittedly taken on in a moment of urgency, when it seemed like everyone was doing things that weren't considered our usual core work. Uh, but let me tell you why it also makes perfect sense for the library to lead the digital inclusion and equity work for our city. So in our digital inclusion work earlier, we had this mantra of digital inclusion being a three-legged stool uh, held up by the three A's, which are access, affordability, and adoption, and libraries being uniquely positioned to address each of these in a way that ensures that they work together seamlessly. So first, what is a library if not a citywide infrastructure for providing access to information, tools, and the knowledge to use those? Uh, also, there is no other agency in a jurisdiction whose mission is to leverage assets and resources, relationships and partnerships to ensure that public access is both democratically available and free of cost to our users. And third, libraries are adept at accessing and using relevant data to inform our work and what our city learned and uh, we in libraries kind of already knew but now we know it even more that none of the other work matters if your low resourced or lower capacity communities and residents do not have skills or to use the technology or the connectivity that is made available to them. Or um, even more so if they fear what being connected means for both adults and their children in terms of issues like privacy, 
safety um, are being monitored by either government or telecommunications companies or both. So I'll just get into a little detail to illustrate the points. Um, so back in early 2020, there was so much urgent need and a community outcry and feelings of desperation on all fronts. We were definitely facing very vocal community opinions and political ideas about the focus of the work. So as library people, we immediately began to center our work with data and commitment to equity. We mapped data. It, was allowed, it allowed us to show uh, decision makers and the community the intersections of specific technology needs with factors such as poverty, language proficiency, educational attainment, and even uh, COVID impacts to see a geographic focus that we could then overlay with telecommunications options and city assets like libraries. And next we had an immediate urgent goal of alleviating the pain being felt by thousands of families and schools with a shift to distance learning, as well as residents who were suddenly cut off from all kinds of services, including the library services. So it made sense for us to provide solutions in alignment with our core mission and capacity. So negotiating and partnering with AT&T, we used our impressive purchasing and materials management infrastructure to receive, process, and distribute nearly 13,000 unthrottled hotspots to qualified households and circulating through the library. And then we also partnered with more than 50 community-based organizations to distribute hotspots to high needs isolated residents. This continued throughout the 2020-2021 academic year. And we're currently transitioning to a modified longer term program because we continue to see this need in a broader community as an entry point to connectivity. So a couple of the other major programs included the installation of a community Wi Fi network in partnership with one of our largest school districts that will provide broadband access to more than 300,000 residents. Uh, we have public works, IT, and contractors doing the installation, and then we work with finance at the city and our city attorneys to facilitate the processes. Honestly, it's a lot of work, um, but here's where the library's leadership role is really important. The library has the greatest understanding from experience of how residents actually access online resources, especially those who may not be the quickest adopters. And then similarly, the importance of our digital literacy efforts cannot be overstated. They are the linchpin in the digital inclusion ecosystem. So now the city could assign a part of this work to libraries separate from all the rest. But in both these programs, it's beneficial that the library can shape the implementation of technologies and infrastructure and have influence on how users can then interface with them and then assess how it's working with those residents in mind. Um, and then finally, we are now in our second round of developing strategies with each tel telecommunications provider in our region. And I can tell you that the library is the most unflinching negotiator at the table. Uh, one of the things that became glaring to me when I entered this work is that our telecommunications providers are focused on customer acquisition and marketplace solutions. So essentially individuals pay for the service that they receive. So it's a big challenge for them to think or act differently than this on any scale, even in a pandemic. Um, but now you know, we have the opportunity to shape the provision of broadband access from a customer acquisitions model to something that is driven by community need. Um, and then being able to leverage the city's resources in these partnerships gives our equity perspective more weight and um, in libraries, we actually have the most precious resource to any sector. We have the public's trust, and that's a really important asset to leverage. Uh, so I will just end there, and I hope that there are questions for later. Thank you very much. I think you're muted, Andrew. Sorry, that has to happen on every Zoom call, so now it's out of the way. Um, I was just saying, Jill, that was fantastic. My, uh, that was such a crisp overview. My notes are almost like uh, studying for an exam. They're that like well laid out in paragraphs and bullet points. Thank you for that. Uh, Juliet, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, Jill, that was really impressive as well. I just want to acknowledge um, how impressive San Jose has done and, and what an amazing role the library there has played. Um, in Philadelphia, similarly, so I won't, you know, I think we all 
kind of know that the pandemic shifted everything. So I won't really get into that um, in much detail. But what I will say is that um, the city responded in a number of ways. Um, and so first and foremost, we really pivoted to our K-12 um, population households um, because there was a real, real crucial and immediate need to get um, our K-12 students connected with the devices and the internet that they needed um, for remote schooling. Um, in the absence of what we had um, had in, in Philadelphia, which was a really robust network of um, libraries and what we called key spots, which came out of the first broadband stimulus grants, that wonderful BTOP program um, that Philadelphia actually um, got a huge award to create more um, public computing centers that we called key spots. And so all of those shut down and we didn't have the ability to provide that level of um, in-person service, um, as everyone knows, uh, during the pandemic. And so getting students, our K-12 households, the devices that they needed and the connectivity that they needed um, and the support in signing up was, became the number one um, issue that we stood up. And, and our solution became PHL Connected, which was um, really focused on this very, very collaborative effort across all types of school partners. So district, um, our 68 charter schools, um, independent mission schools, and any other um, independent schools that wanted to participate. Um, we uh, did a bulk purchasing agreement with T-Mobile for hotspots, and then a sponsored service agreement with Comcast Internet Essentials, which um, is headquartered in Philadelphia, and we have um, a very robust relationship with Comcast there. Um, and then um, we're able to provide about 15,000 internet connections across the city um, to house K-12 households who needed it. Um, we also stood up um, access centers um, utilizing our recreation centers and community-based organizations to make sure that those who needed, students who needed to go to um, another location had a place to go um, for supervised remote learning. Um, so that was a key component of standing those up and actually enabling more Wi-Fi access at those locations. Um, many of those locations were part of this larger public computing sector network that we had already established. So we were really building upon things that the city had already created um, prior to the pandemic. Um, and then we did some fast track grants um, for digital navigation, um, which really became um, really valuable. We set up um, helplines in um, community-based organizations in key areas of the city, including one that had um, enormous amount of language support for residents whose first language was not English. Um, and um, those digital navigators could answer phone calls from anyone um, to help them get low cost or free devices, help them get access to low cost or free internet, including enrolling in PHL Connected if they weren't sure how to do that. So connecting them very closely with our school coordinators and our community co coordinators and our librarians across the city to make sure that everybody knew that this network existed um, and then helping them kind of get to that next step of the three prong, which is devices, connectivity, and then the skills that they needed to, to get that further support. Um, and then we also launched something called PHL Donate Tech to really drive um, devices into resident hands. Um, and so we worked with a number of our refurbishing partners to do that. Um, but the real, um, and then the, the real thing that happened is that like San Jose, the, we raised this issue within the city to a mayoral initiative. So we said, this is, you know, internet access is something that's critical. It's something that is, um, necessary now in home or as um, with somebody, a connected device with somebody, because we know that not everybody has a stable home to go to, is really essential. And that cannot just be a mobile phone. And we really, really made that connection very crystal clear that mobile phone access was not enough for participation, full participation in, um, in everything that you needed to do. Um, and so because we were able to do that, we started um, something called the Digital Equity Coordinating Committee, um, which was um, a, we pulled together entities or representatives from different departments across the city 
um, and uh, our, our quasi departments across the city. So groups like Philadelphia Gas Works or um, other entities, PHA, that don't necessarily report to the city, but are um, these quasi entities, and really started to work on a digital equity strategy for the city. And we are knee deep in that process right now. Um, and uh, meeting regularly with different work streams focused on K-12, focused on public computing centers and digital literacy um, that lead into workforce opportunities, focused on infrastructure, how we can improve our infrastructure, how we can leverage our assets like our city buildings, our library buildings, potentially our recreation centers to create more and greater assets um, and greater Wi-Fi for the city. Um, and potentially a public network that could be used by residents at lower cost. Um, so those are all things that we are working on right now. And um, we, we have, we also launched something called the um, Philadelphia Internet Household Assessment. So one of the big key things that came out of the pandemic was how poor the data was that everybody, the public data that everybody had access to. Most folks who are using public data are using well, at the beginning of the epidemic, we're using um, uh, ACS, American Community Survey data from 2018 um, or earlier. Um, and there was a massive um, shift that happened around access. And so <clears throat> people kept asking us, well, how many people right now in Philadelphia don't have access? How many people don't have access? And we kept saying, we don't have good data. The FCC doesn't have good data. And so everything that we're looking at is pre-pandemic. A lot has happened in this pandemic. Huge initiatives were created out of this horrible pandemic. And yet for the first time, we were able to raise this issue in a way that allowed collective cities and libraries and entities to actually address it in a way they never were able to before. And so a lot has shifted. And so we launched the survey just a few weeks ago and we're gonna get real-time data about exactly how many people are still disconnected how many people lack devices in Philadelphia that we can use as we build in our digital equity strategy and that we can um, see the progress over the, past, um, over the past year during the pandemic to see where we are, what our benchmark is um, and see where we really need to go. Um, and so all of these things we hope will help us kind of move this effort forward. Fantastic, thank you, Julia. Jenny. Hi everyone, so glad to join you. It was great to jump on a Zoom call and see John and Michelle and Robert Miller and Crosby. What a great group of people to be involved with. Um, I'm here to talk about some of our statewide initiatives that we have in play in Montana right now using both our CARES Act and some of our ARPA funds. And I apologize, I'm not sure why my camera is so dark. I wanted to drop just a couple of reference links into the chat so that you have the ability to look back at some of the uh, resources that I'm just going to briefly describe. So in Montana, I'm very sad to say that um, broadband now now ranks Montana 50th for broadband access in the country. We've dropped a percentage point here in the last couple of months. So um, 91% of Montanans have access to, to DSL, but that's woefully inadequate in this day and age, especially with so many parents and, and students trying to live and work and learn remotely. And uh, so that's something that we have taken very seriously at the Montana State Library. Um, many of you are probably familiar with uh, some of the hotspot lending models that have been in existence in various libraries and, and areas of the country for a number of years. And um, we used to tease Mobile Beacon a bit when they would call the State Library in Montana and, and say, you know, Let, let's try a pilot. And we'd say, oh, is, uh, is T-Mobile and Sprint going to be offering services in Montana? And they'd check and they would say no. Um, about uh, I guess uh, probably in November, December of 2019, we finally had uh, T-Mobile service in North Central Montana, um, one of our more rural areas butting up against the Blackfoot Indian Reservation. 
And so at that point, we had decided that we were going to seek some grant funds to do a hotspot lending pilot. And uh, just, just to test and, and learn what we at the State Library might need to know about how to manage a hotspot lending program and to give libraries the ability to learn the technology and understand what kinds of uh, patron inquiries they might, uh, they might get. And then of course the pandemic hit and it was really an opportunity for us to seize the moment and ramp up a, a program that hadn't even launched into something that was going to be statewide. Um, we took a proposal to the Montana State Library Commission to deploy hotspots around the state using our CARES Act funds. We did get a little bit of pushback from one of our state library commissioners who felt that a hotspot lending program doesn't really scale to address uh, needs in, in a, a robust way. Uh, and, you know, like a, like a community Wi-Fi program might or something like that. But we knew we didn't have the resources to do anything more expansive than that and felt like through the hotspot lending program, we would have a chance to make a real difference we very much view the hotspot lending program as a stopgap measure until Montana can address some of these other needs that exist in the state. And, and hopefully we'll start um, taking advantage of some of the funding that's coming available to address some of those needs. Um, for now though, the hotspot lending program is, is um, serving a, a very real need that we have in our communities. We have pilot, um, partnered with Verizon and T-Mobile through state of Montana term contracts that the state has with those providers to procure and deploy uh, almost 900 hotspots to date. Those two uh, major carriers do not serve the far no northeastern corner of Montana. So we've also partnered with a local telecommunications company called Nemont that serves that area. And they've been a really terrific partner. We had a budget of what we could afford per hotspot. We're spending uh, about $30 a month per hotspot. Their costs were a little bit higher than that. And so they were willing to donate the cost difference to help make sure that hotspots were affordable in those areas. So we were able to take advantage of those kinds of contracts and those kinds of partnerships to deploy something fairly quickly. Um, a couple of points that might be of interest to some of the librarians out there. Um, at the Montana State Library, we actually own the hotspots and we are lending them to libraries who are then lending them to their patrons, making them available in community centers and, and other areas throughout their communities. That's a, a, um, a model that we hit upon working with IMLS and their staff because the state library is SIPA compliant. And because we were using federal funds to procure and deploy these hotspots, we needed to make sure that we were SIPA compliant. So that's the model that we're using rather than having libraries procure the hotspots on their own. Um, we, in addition to the hotspots, we've also purchased iPads and tablets to also donate to libraries for them to lend to their patrons for patrons who don't have uh, other kinds of computer access. The program has been going remarkably well. I just wanted to share a couple of quick success stories. We actually have a vaccination clinic in Missoula County, Montana that does not have internet access. And so they are using a hotspot checked out from their local library to provide internet access at a vaccination clinic. Um, a story from a patron in Ennis, Montana. Uh, he and his family had just moved to the state and he was hoping to start a small business and had a meeting scheduled with investors and realized at the last minute that he did not have internet access. And he came into his library frantic, angry, frustrated, wanting to know what solutions the librarian could offer. And she gave him the option of using their internet access in the library or checking out a hotspot. 
He quickly checked out of the hotspot and, and ran away uh, only to come back a couple of hours later, incredibly grateful that he'd been able to have his successful meeting. Jenny, this is your this is your like one minute warning. We one have minute. a hard stop uh, at uh, three, and I want uh, Felton to have enough time to speak. Absolutely. So, two, one more quick story. Um, a minister contacted us. Uh, she needed to hold a funeral in a cemetery, uh, and family could not travel together to to uh, be a part of that kind of momentous family occasion. And so she checked out a hot spot and was able to conduct a funeral in a remote Montana cemetery via Zoom using the hotspot that she had checked out from her local library. And she let us know what a difference that made in the lives of the families able to participate in that program. And just quickly, uh, the state of Massachusetts is now following on the model that we've developed here in Montana. So happy to answer more questions. Awesome, thanks so much, Jenny. Uh, Felton, over to you. Andrew, and thanks, and thanks to uh, Jenny, Juliet, and Jill for putting a hard deal in front of me there. And I'm not sure how I got on this panel because it looks like you have to have the first letter J in your name, but I blame that on John Bracken. So as I said, you can't tell the story of the Cleveland Public Library during the pandemic without understanding the Cleveland story. And it's a story that is built on redlining, um, much of the east side of Cleveland, the predominantly African-American side of Cleveland um, has no broadband infrastructure. And so we are the third least connected city, big city in the, in the nation. Much of that because there is actually no infrastructure to be connected um, to broadband. And so with that, about five years ago, that understanding of when you overlay where the most poverty is in the city of Cleveland, when you overlay where the most health disparities are in the city of Cleveland, where you overlay a lot of the other bigger disparities um, are in the city of Cleveland, it fits right on top of that map of where there is not the infrastructure for broadband in the community. And I think that really started four years ago, the base for what is now the Greater Cleveland Digital Equity Coalition, the realization that um, there is a lot of work on the infrastructure that needs to be done. Then comes the pandemic and a spotlight is put on the fact that the students don't have any internet at home, can't get any internet at home, and there is a gigantic struggle for what we're going to do. Um, the library and the other organizations that were a part at that point in time had really already started doing the groundwork to be able to just start running. And that's really kind of how we kind of moved along and where the Clinton Public Library was a part of it. And so I wanna talk about four areas that we really were a big part of, of during this period of time that the library played a essential role in. Number one, we were a dis distribution center. Not only were we checking out hotspots, but um, PCs for people were handing out computers through our building. We were working with Microsoft through a grant with PLA to hand out tablets through our libraries. We were handing out laptops through other organizations, refurbished laptops. So people were coming in to get access. Um, and because we have 27 libraries throughout the city of Cleveland in every neighborhood, it was easier to distribute through the library than um, a lot of different agencies trying to do it on their own. So number one, distribution center. Number two, an internet provider ourselves. So what we did is we boosted our signal so our signal could be out basically on each of our libraries throughout the full street that we were on um, as much as we possibly could to get as many people access to the library's internet. Um, and in doing that also, we put in solar power charging stations at every one of our libraries. So all of our community members who wanted to do just a drive in during the pandemic and then power up what they had or use the, um, our, you know, our parking lots as many libraries were doing, were able to do that and continue to charge up their, uh, their tablets or whatever they were using. Number three, we worked to become a digital navigator really in a, I think this is one area that uh, I really want to talk about in, in question and answer, if we're going to have that, is the fact that the library is essential to what I think is the future, which is digital literacy, not necessarily just digital access. And so 
we have been train, training our staff to be navigators and then go into communities and create community ambassadors. So creating about 20 or 25 people in every library so that they can go into their communities and be, when someone says, I don't know how to do this, the ambassadors are doing that and our foundations have provided those ambassadors with the stipend, the $500 to really keep them interested in wanting to be an ambassador. And then finally, advocacy. We have a situation going on right now. It was, they were supposed to have the meeting, the hearing this morning. It turned around and they're doing it this, this evening. But we are advocating through the libraries across the state for the fact that um, the Senate, just as they were ready to put forward a budget that was going to include $190 million for, uh, uh, for broadband, have taken that broadband out of the budget. And they put in a, a, a new kind of provision in which it says, libraries, schools, and other government entities can't work with anyone who is creating a new kind of internet provider or, or kind of municipal provider or something of that nature, specifically done by the ISPs to intentionally stop any of these kind of coalitions to be able to create, you know, the, the type of things we need to get everyone access. So those are for distribution center, internet provider, digital navigator, and then advocacy. Those are the things that we've been working on. Well, Felton, you just anticipated my question, which was like to just go to the most controversial thing right now. I, my jaw hit the ground when I, I, I read about that in Ohio, not just the elimination of support for broadband, but an actual ban on anybody uh, uh, in the public sphere doing something that might compete with uh, the existing incumbent ISPs. Um, I'm glad you're advocating on that. I'm glad you feel advocate, uh, able to advocate on that. Can I ask uh, if anybody else has strategies for dealing with this kind of like you you depend on partnerships with the ISPs uh, in order to uh, take advantage of their services and at the same time in some states uh, maybe in all states they are actively trying to um, oppose the efforts of libraries to be significant players in, in providing connectivity in this way. Um, Jenny, Jill, Juliet, any comments on that? I mean, we're in a place in, in Pennsylvania where um, we are not allowed to create municipal networks um, if there is any service available at broadband speeds. Um, there, that law was passed actually after Philadelphia tried to create wireless Philadelphia. Um, and so um, we are up against some similar challenges. Um, we leveraged our franchise agreements um, to really push this issue with our ISP partners. And we um, created a, the Digital Literacy Alliance um, through that effort, which includes our, our community-based organizations and our ISP partners together um, so that they can hear directly what the needs are. And we can push them as well on where we need support. Um, it is a... Um, it is a constant discussion and a constant point of advocacy, but what I would say is having um, um, outside advocates um, that are not part of the city or, or from the city, it can also be really, really valuable. Um, and they're really, really crucial in addressing this at a statewide level um, because that's where, that's where it needs to get addressed. Well, that was going to, that sort of anticipates my pitch, which is, uh, I was just going to say to those of us like me who are not actually employed, but are kind of active supporters from the outside, this is an absolutely critical issue. It's something that we have to be active on. We can't uh, rely on um, librarians and their um, staffs because they are in a very fraught position for any number of kind of obvious political reasons. So this is something that we're going to have to advocate for. Go ahead, Felton. Can I add something there? Um, I was very, very surprised, but I, I guess I really shouldn't have been. We have been working with the business community on this and they have come along with this. It was a hard thing, but I think the pandemic opened their eyes to the fact that they really, digital equity was really, really important. And when the state when put this out, the first person I heard from was our Greater Cleveland Partnership, which was our chamber. 15 minutes after it was put out, they put out a letter saying this is not going to happen. And they came out and have been doing a great deal of lobbying, as has the a similar type thing in Cincinnati and Columbus. Those those chambers have come out against this, and you know it's 
you know, they're trying to sneak it through. They were trying to sneak it through. And the, the, the business entities are saying, this is not happening, right? And so at least we have them on our side this time. All right, well, listen, we have uh, hit our hard stop. I, I regret that I was not uh, stricter about timing at the beginning or, or maybe shut up more myself. I'm sorry about that. Uh, we didn't get to get into the E-rate details, some of the details of these programs. So let me just encourage those of you who are here participating, please carry on the conversation uh, uh, out of channel. Um, uh, uh, Juliet, Jenny, Jill, Felton are all e easy people to connect with and to find online. Um, and I know that they are all uh, open-hearted uh, individuals who will be glad to talk with you. Um, let me say to uh, Jorge and John, thanks so much for getting this uh, uh, set of um, reports from the field out on the table. Um, and uh, Jorge, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Andrew. And, and thank you, Jenny, Julie, Jill, even Felton. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Always a pleasure to hear from you, Felton. Oh, thank you you know, and I'm glad to say that LeBron only left Miami once. He left Cleveland twice. Just saying, just saying. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you are. Those are fighting words. It is, it is. But <laughs> hopefully I'll see you again in Miami, my friend. I'll, I'll be sure to have bodyguards. But I look forward to it. <laughs> Well, thank you, folks. This was uh, this was really a wonderful conversation, and it does underscore a lot of the challenges that are being faced, as you know, communities are trying to find alternatives to the established ISPs and telcos and such. And and it was great to hear about, you know, how the, all this really goes back to the old days of Wireless Philadelphia, when they first started, and uh, you know, it seemed they, that a movement began of really eviscerating local communities from the ability to control or negotiate with the local companies and everything's been moved up to the state level. I'm sure there were some good reasons for it, but unfortunately taking away that local control really sort of ties the hands of communities and their ability to negotiate deals like they had in the past of getting connectivity for community centers, parks and other places. I'm hoping that something happens in the policy level later on um, uh, that maybe remedies some of that, which is a great segue to our next topic, a really interesting conversation coming up. Um, so is everybody on that needs to be on? Um, is the, let's see, let's see if we've got all the next speakers on. Um, I don't see Diane. I don't see Alberto. I don't see Greg Lucas on. Ah, there's Alberto Ibarguen. Fantastic. And now we just need, uh, I know Crosby's on. If we can promote Crosby a second. And there's Diane Kaplan. So fantastic. So this next conversation really came out of a conversation a few weeks ago that occurred where our President and CEO Alberto Ibarguen, who I've had the privilege of working many years with, asked of surprisingly simple but yet complex questions. What else can libraries do to sort of make broadband much more available in their local Hello. communities? Hey, Alberto, thank you. And so today, besides Alberto, who's going to be moderating, we're joined by Crosby Kemper. Uh, Crosby is the, not only the current head of Institute of Museum and Library Services, IMLS, the biggest funder of libraries in the United States, also a former head of the local library in Kansas City, uh, known him for many years, and he's been a great colleague. And um, we also are joined by Diane Kaplan, uh, CEO of Rasmussen Foundation in uh, Alaska. Um, Interesting tidbit, somehow Diane and her colleagues convinced John Bracken to jump into the ice chilling waters of Alaska on a trip up there. As bears were looking on in the back, I don't know how you convinced them, but- It wasn't hard, it wasn't hard. I'll say yes to anything, you know that, George. <laughs> right. <laughs> and also we have Greg Lucas joining us. He is the state librarian for uh, California. And interesting that uh, he's a former journalist, so uh, I'm sure Alberto and he will have plenty to, to talk about in the future. 
besides today's topic. So I'm really excited to have all of you here and I'm really curious to, to hear what, li what can libraries do to really ex you know, help expand broadband in their communities. And you know, especially after hearing some of the challenges that libraries are facing in the previous panel uh, to making this a broader uh, service in their communities. So Alberto, take it away. Thank you. This is uh, this is known as just in time. I've actually been <clears throat> for the last twenty minutes, almost twenty minutes, been trying to figure out how to get on uh, this system as it kept on asking me for a different password. So I was beginning to sweat it. I did, however, catch you talking about uh, Diane getting John to jump into the ice cold waters. I think that's. I think you can talk John into almost anything. But talking me into going fishing with a black bear, fishing for salmon with a black bear behind me, with no wall or moat in between us, that's above and beyond. Uh, but she did it. Uh, anyhow, this is a great uh, pleasure to be, uh, uh, to be with you uh, all and, and uh, Diane Crosby and, and uh, Greg. Um, Really, this this is a uh, a conversation we could actually have for many hours. We just have a few minutes, and so um, I think we probably ought to focus on the core elements about what is the service we're trying to uh, to deliver, who's the audience we're trying to reach, um, and why is it that libraries are the place. Um, that uh, that audience uh, ought to go to for that uh, for that that particular service. I think anybody who runs an organization, who runs a business, who runs a political campaign, uh, thinks about audience. Uh, anyone who thinks that I'm entitled to be here is really that is that was that was early 20th century thinking. Um, it, the, the competitive landscape is such uh, with digital that the, that the kinds of intellectual services that might be offered are available in so many different ways from so many different places um, that you really have to have a very clear sense of, uh, of what part of your community you're serving. I thought there was a, there was a conversation we had not too long ago um, that's something that, that I think was sponsored by MacArthur Foundation, where I also, where I mentioned that I thought, and Crosby, you were on that, uh, where I, th I mentioned that I thought libraries still had an enormous advantage over others uh, in the area of trust, uh, in the area of being physically in the communities where still so many millions of Americans are on the other side of the digital divide and libraries have an opportunity to include that, that part of America um, that is still second-class citizens because they are not digital, that are, they're, not, they're second class politically, they're second class socially, they're certainly second class economically. Um, and you, if, you can't, if you can't apply for a job except online and you have no other way of doing it, and this is not new, um, this is a this is a terrible thing, and why not have the library be the place where you can go and begin to get your access to the rest of the world, the access uh, to uh, uh, to the world through uh, through uh, a free and universal web. I think libraries have uh, have this tremendous opportunity, despite the budget problems, despite the misinformation. The misunderstanding, as I call it misinformation, the misunderstanding of a library as a place that has dust on books and you go and you're quiet and somebody is there shushing you and, uh, and telling you, uh, no, you can't borrow more than two books at a time. Um, that's, a, that's what it was, uh, maybe, but that's not what it needs to be. Um, and that's certainly not the way to the future. Um, I, I'll get off my little soapbox and ask uh, Diane to talk some about that. Di, uh, Diane Kaplan from, from Alaska, where I've never seen a place that more 
that, 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 it, that stands to benefit more from internet than, uh, than Alaska and medicine and education and culture and the work that she's doing up there with libraries, I think is terrific. So Diane, why don't we start with you and then go straight, because since we don't have much time, go straight from you to Crosby and then to Greg, and then we'll have a few minutes to, to have general discussion. You're on mute, yeah. Thank you so much, Alberto, and good to see you, everybody who's on, old friends. It's funny to be asked to speak about broadband because I am in no way an expert in this subject, but I've been around it for a long time and there are reasons I really care about it as president of the only uh, large foundation in the state of Alaska. First of all, Alaska ranks last in internet connectivity, 51st among all the states in the District of Columbia. Large parts of our state have no wired coverage whatsoever. Actually, most uh, regions of the state don't. And 0% of Alaskans, 0% have access to a low priced internet plan, which means $60 a month or less. And 51% of the rest of the US has that. Our average price for internet service is $140 a month, meaning many, many families cannot afford internet, even if it is available. And then our speed is only uh, faster than five other states. So we're way at the bottom in that as well. So how do libraries and internet connect? And how does a private foundation like ours and internet connect? Well, first of all, on Friday, we finished three days of meetings of the Rasmussen Foundation. Uh, we have a 12 member board. We did site visits like we used to do in the old days pre-pandemic. And then we ended up back in, in town to talk about strategy, particularly around the fact our investments have done well the first part of this year. And we expect we'll have a number of millions more than we thought we would to invest. We ended up after several hours of discussion to believe that our biggest play right now is supporting broadband expansion. Why? Because first of all, um, in a, a discipline that has uh, struggled to find resources uh, for many, many years, we have an infrastructure bill coming our way that's gonna invest possibly a hundred billion dollars into infrastructure. This is a moment in time that may never ever come again. So we have to pay attention to it. And it's the state that could be most impacted with a very weak economy right now, with very high unemployment right now, with low educational achievement right now, we have to be. And the pandemic clearly um, emphasized how the lack of that coverage and the speed and the accessibility impacts our students, our families, and our economy in a significant way. About a year ago, um, we went to talk to the library because back in 2011, when the Gates Foundation was getting active in broadband, we decided to become a partner in that. It was really our first toe in the water. And we were able to make through the state library some significant progress connecting 65 communities. And today, if you go around rural Alaska, Every library has a parking lot that is full of people who are there specifically in their cars, on their iPhones, because just about everybody in the state has an iPhone, whether they have internet connection or not, using that as the community hub. And we thought that's the place to begin because this is the organization that stepped up first on broadband. But today our governor announced the members of a new uh, broadband expansion task force and there's no one representing libraries on it. So my challenge to the librarians is, if you're not part of the discussion in your state right now, you should fire yourself. And I mean it, this is too important. You cannot let this moment go by. And we um, are going to do whatever we can to ensure that the libraries will be at the table. They have the only experience that we've got in the state. They can't be ignored. and just on a very practical basis, the inability to distribute large quantities of materials on a statewide basis due to lack of bandwidth. Um, you all know what the challenges are right now. 
So it's really time to step up and everyone has to. Um, we will be looking at where we can intersect. We've already been talking with our commissioners who are leading this task force from commerce and education to encourage that we build on what's been built in the past and not try and start from square one, that we look at the true digital divide we have in the state and prioritize uh, not only availability, but accessibility through lowering costs across the state. And uh, we know that if we don't rise to this challenge right now, um, that, that we will pay for it dearly in the years to come. One community I wanna talk about is Unalaska. It is the single largest port for fisheries in the United States of America. They produce more fish except for Bedford, Massachusetts, inched ahead in terms of dollar value. Thousands and thousands of workers from all around the world descend on Unalaska and its canneries every year, delivering seafood to the entire world. There is no access to internet in this community. It's the single most issue for it. And we have dozens and dozens and dozens more. And we cannot build an economy on one of our strongest in industries without tackling this head on. So we're at the table. I suspect many of our colleagues will be. And librarians, this is your moment. Terrific, Crosby. Hey, thanks, Alberta and, and Diane. It's so good to see you and, and wonderful things that you're you're doing in Alaska. Um, uh, you know, the, the the digital divide is an issue of connectivity. Um, when, when I became came to the IM, IMLS a, a year and a half ago, it was my intention to solve that problem, and we did. Uh, the federal government's now going to give us. Diane's talking about 100 billion dollars. We're not sure what's going to be in the infrastructure bill. We know it's already in ARPA. <clears throat> and uh, and and uh, in the basic uh, basic Biden budget going forward, um, it, it's a huge. There's a huge amount of money, a huge amount of money flowing uh, in into broadband. Um, and and the problem, which Diane just just recognized, is is libraries are not really at the table in this in the way that they ought to be. And and the disconnect here uh, is very simple. Libraries are local; um, they're not national. Uh, of course, that puts some, some some of the onus on us at the IMLS as a national organization uh, to, to do something about this. But the pandemic highlighted the, the issues with regard to broadband and the digital divide. And broadband is now considered in Congress and I believe in the executive branch of utility. I, we fought for that for, for, for the last couple of decades. I think that's happened. But as, as was talked about already by uh, Diane and and it certainly it was talked about by the previous panelists. Uh, that that doesn't solve the problem. We're going to have a lot of money, and every and every community is going to be connected, um, and most individuals are going to be connected after we finish spending all this money. It will probably take a decade to spend all this money. Um, but the real question isn't utility. The real question is use. Um, and uh, there there is a, a an article in the New York Times today that I think presents our problem in a nutshell. Uh, Eduardo Porter, their economics correspondent, uh, wrote this article, well, you can't see it, sorry. Black people narrowed skills gap, the pay gap persists. Is it racism? Well, I'll cut to the chase, the balance of the, of the article, he quotes a number of uh, economists saying race is probably, probably a factor in this. I mean, the, the statistics are really incredible. We're actually in a bigger gap position than we were in 1980. Um, uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the economic gap, even though the skill gap in terms of graduation from high school, which is a, 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 a metric that he uses in the article, has, has decreased. But the skill gap in usable education, um, education they refers to in the article as a, a more abstract education, say algebra, um, we haven't done as well. Uh, we haven't done nearly as well. And, 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 and this pulls me back to what the importance of libraries and the importance of use in broadband as opposed to the utility and the connectivity. Um, as chair of, you know, when Google Fiber came to Kansas City and I suddenly became an expert uh, on this and, uh, and, and chairing a commission of the future of higher education in Missouri um, and, and then watching what happened uh, when I chaired Shelby, uh, I, I become a firm believer that libraries are a key part of the educational infrastructure of this country. 
uh, and and relative and 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 that is also an important part of the economic infrastructure. Skill development. Increasingly, skills are developed on the internet, are developed virtually, are virtual skills, uh, and and libraries are very good at uh, at promoting that. In fact, what, what we heard from uh, from uh, Jill and Jenny and Juliet about what they're doing at Felton uh, is extraordinary. An extraordinary thing's going on in, in Alaska uh, around this as well. Libraries are doing that work. Um, and uh, and I, at the IMLS, that's what we, we want to encourage. And, and in terms of my view of the world, it's really a Tocquevillian view of the world. People coming together, what's been strong about this country is people coming together at the local level in local associations to solve local problems. We have national funding now for this, but the problems really are all delivered locally, particularly education problems. And, and, and our, the basic gaps in our society uh, are, are only going to be solved if we improve people's skills. Racism is a problem, but is it, is it the, the, the basic gravamen of this article is it's not the fundamental problem. It can be overcome. It is being overcome. But the problem we're not solving is the skill development for not only people of color, but people at the at the bottom of the of the barrel, the underclass in this country uh, of all colors. We're not solving that problem. Libraries are in the right place. Librarians have the right skill sets, and now we're likely to have have the ability to deliver the technology. But we have to see that happen. And uh, one of the things that I think we need to develop do more of is developing consortia at the local level both for political reasons to, to talk to the governors when they get their whatever 300 billion or whatever it's gonna be in infrastructure money, some of which can be, much of which can be used for broadband and which has to be used not just for connectivity but has to use for these skill development uh, activities. Um, so the, the IMLS is, uh, is focused on, on that and will we'll continue to be focused as long as, as I'm the director. I also think we need to be focused on something that libraries have forgotten about a little bit. Um, we're still doing it every every day. It's still central, it's still important, but we don't talk about it, we don't think about it, we're not creative enough about it. And that is the basic skill set on which all the other skill sets are built, which is a skill of reading. We've sort of been in a, in a state of stasis as far as reading is concerned. We marginally, and uh, because of No Child Left Behind, because of what uh, the governors were, were doing, et cetera, uh, we marginally improved the, the racial gaps in the, in the early 2000s, and that's stopped now. Um, and we have, to, we have to focus on that because that is the basic skill and connect it ultimately to what we do on the internet uh, and the skills gap there. So uh, that, that's, that's our focus, um, and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm here to uh, continue to fund the platforms like uh, uh, Lyricist and S Simply E, the DPLA, you know, the Internet Archive, the, uh, the various things that, that we're doing to, uh, to, to create national platforms around the, these educational activities. But at the end of the day, it's, always, it's all going to be delivered uh, locally, and, and I hope that we can make that, continue to make that point. You, Greg, you've got about 30 seconds. No, I'm kidding, but not long. Well, well, that's fine. If you want to go right to questions, that's cool with me. I, um, no, you should go ahead. Uh, I did want to thank Crosby and Diane. Um, and, and just to answer your question, Alberto, right, who, who is our audience? Right, the old saw is that libraries are the most welcoming place for the most disenfranchised. And so right now in California, over the past seven years, we've connected 900 of our 1130 libraries to a high speed broadband network. And so there's 23,000 terminals in California's local libraries and they're used 23 million times a year. So, I mean, we're already providing uh, a link to the least connected people in California. Um, and I mean, I guess it's, it's nice to have, it's, you know, it's terrific to have connected 900 of 1130 libraries, but I mean, the remaining 230 are the hard ones and, and the 900 that are connected, right? California is just like the rest of the country. Half of our libraries are 40 years of age or older. So just cause we're plugging in one gigabyte of the wiring and the routers in those older buildings aren't delivering that on the inside of the walls. So like Crosby was saying, I mean, this is, there's a multiplicity of 
issues and challenges that are involved. And I think sort of globally, nationally, and what we're trying to do in California at the state level is, you know, the thing they talk about in management classes all the time, right? What's the most important thing to do right now? And so for us in California, the new fiscal year is starting and our focus is to think about libraries plus. So how can we find projects where a library is connected to the, the high-speed broadband network plus a school, plus telehealth, and where we can do it, right, plus a tribal nation. And doing those, doing those multiple projects in one kind of bid brings into play a lot of federal discounts and may, and as at least in the few projects like that we've done already, made connecting hard to connect places more financially attractive. I think uh, it's easy. Up, sorry. No, I think that's very, I think that's very good and very practical. I think it's easy uh, to agree with each of the three of you. What I would, what I would say is a is is one of my biggest frustrations as somebody that has long thought. I mean, literally fifteen years worth with George Martinez uh, have been working at one point or another to try to get libraries viewed as. As, um, as connecting hubs is that it just strikes me as such an incredible opportunity. As long as I, I, I couldn't agree more, Crosby, that, that the content uh, really matters ultimately. But right now we're at a point where, yeah, all this money is coming down the pike and a hell of a lot of people have their hand out. If the libraries are not in there somehow, and it's not, the, it's not the normal kind of activity for libraries, for librarians, uh, but maybe they have sponsors on city councils or maybe they have citizens or maybe they have mailing lists or maybe they can, can get people uh, to, tell the, the, uh, uh, to tell the city council what, here in Miami, they were gonna cut, this is about 10 years ago, they were gonna cut the budget by a third. Uh, the library budget by a third. So we took a poll, Knight Foundation took a poll, and all we did was pu publish the results of the poll. And it said the lowest, the lowest precinct out of the 13 that make up the commission, the lowest was support in support for the library budget was 60, something like 62%, up to 85%. Guess what happened? You think these people are stupid? No, they didn't vote the cuts. They absolutely didn't vote the cuts. You've got to, this is a moment of opportunity. We have been talking about this digital divide for 15 years or more. The, the, it just strikes me as politically just so logical that the thing to do now is to get that money, to get the numbers up. And if you have a mass of people who are on through the library, you've got a mass of people who are going to demand services. If they demand services, who are they gonna demand it of? Maybe to the library, maybe to the city council, and maybe all of a sudden, people on city councils are going to say, oh, maybe the library is not dead. Maybe there, there is a point to this. So librarians need to, to, to take their, their, their most important customers, which is all their customers maybe, um, and, and show up in the mayor's office and show up in the governor's office. I mean, the governor's got $10 billion, you know, all the governors have $10 billion from the ARPA right now that could be used for libraries, it could be used for broadband. Uh, we've got $7 billion or whatever it is in the connectivity fund at the, uh, at the FCC. And I mean, it's flowing over there. And that's before we get to the infrastructure bill. But all this money is going to be controlled by politicians, I guarantee you. And librarians have never been good wow. at talking, at talking to at being advocates with politicians. And we've got to change that. Now, I'm not supposed to be an advocate as a federal agency head, but to hell with that. We should be advocates. Um, we need to be advocates for, for library. We need to get in people's faces. And we need to, you know, I, my favorite uh, uh, activity at the Kansas City Public Library is I took 100 teenagers uh, uh, to uh, uh, Governor Nixon's office when he reduced the state library budget. It didn't really affect Kansas City Public Library, but I could organize the teenagers. And we had the joy of being thrown out of his office, but it got national attention. It got great attention in Missouri and national attention. And we, we, need, we need to be doing things like that. We need to highlight the fact that libraries are here, that we're not, uh, you know, as I think uh, uh, George 
uh, said earlier, you know, the the, the fusty, uh, or, or maybe you said that, said it, Alberto. You know, the, the the idea of the the library as a place uh, uh, of an old tradition um, uh, where people sit in silence. Um, it, we need to stop being silent. That's for sure. Well, may, maybe it's as simple as uh, as sign up sheets at the library uh, saying if you'd like to let your city council know. Uh, that you uh, want some federal money for expanded internet services at the library. Here are the addresses of, uh, of the people who, who are going to dis distribute the money. If you'd like, and if I, I'll never forget, this is not a library example, but I'll never, as long as I live, forget watch, seeing what telemedicine meant in, in a place in Eastern, in far, far, far Western Alaska, I felt like we were almost out by the Aleutians uh, that Diane took us to, and in a, and then and then we traveled north on a river on a on a small boat, and in that village, people were getting fantastic telemedicine from Anchorage. They couldn't possibly have gone because there are no roads. Uh, they couldn't possibly afford it because who, who can afford an airplane ride uh, for for uh, for a possible checkup? And if it's serious then they can bring you in. But in the meanwhile, uh, that kind of access, and this was all done in a community center, that kind of access, I think uh, we need to organize around. And until we get people who, are, who, are, who see this as their, as their community, as they, when they, that they are the constituency, I think we're going to keep talking about what we would do if we had the people or what we would do if we had the money. Let's get the money. This is the opportunity now, I think. I, I don't know, George, if, if you're giving us the hook. Is that why you came back? Never the hook. Just a gentle reminder, Alberto, that it's time for our next panel. And oh, this has okay. been a fascinating discussion. Diane, Crosby, Greg, Alberto, thank you so much. And actually, you know, one thing I, that you didn't mention, Crosby, I mean, you sort of talked a little bit, I think somebody mentioned E-rate, but there is a lot of money out there already, even beyond all this additional money that's already going to libraries and schools. It's just a matter of sort of freeing some of that, allowing them to maybe actively share their sure. signals outside so people yeah. don't have they're, to hang out in the cars. Still regulatory issues. And, and unfortunately the FCC continues to be run by lawyers. Oh, shouldn't have said that. That's okay. We, we know some of them and we still love them. That's okay. <laughs> as, a as a recovering lawyer, I resemble that remark. <laughs> <laughs> but thank everybody. This was a fascinating panel and again, more stimulating thought and but I, I think the big question is what can libraries do and why aren't we you know and I guess it's really just taking that next step and and just having those conversations what's the worst they can tell you no yeah you know I'm IT I'm used to that doesn't stop me as Alberto will tell you thank you everybody and so we're on to our next Speaking panel which next steps yes and this is another fascinating one to sort of wrap things up with, uh, you know, with all the great discussions we've had today so far. We have our board member and also president of the. Uh oh, George, did you freeze or did I freeze? Well, I think I might, George Froze, I hope you guys can still hear me. I'm uh, back. I can hear you. And all so right. We... All right. Well, this is perfect timing, George. We, you know, we could not have a discussion about broadband and access without some sort of blurp in the, in the stream. Um, I think the, you know, the tee up from the, the funders conversation is, is really a call to action for us. And I think this notion of the urgency of the moment this unique opportunity we have to ensure access for all is, is where we're starting from. And we're very lucky, you know, under Tracy's leadership, one of the first things that came out of the ALA as Tracy Hall came in as executive director a year and a half ago or so now was a declaration, a firm flag putting in the ground that access to broadband is a human right. And, you know, building off that inspiration and the conversation we've been having today, I'm really excited to turn the mic over 
to her in, in a conversation with John Palfrey uh, to help us to pick up the main George that you just said, which is what, what comes next? What is to be done? John and Tracy, over to you. John Bracken, thank you so much. And Tracy Hall, it's so fun to be with you in this uh, in this setting and in any setting, of course. Uh, for those who don't know Tracy as president of the ALA, she's one of the most exciting people in this space and uh, comes out of the funding space too. So she knows all aspects of this work. Um, and Tracy, we're sort of the next steps panel, I think, here and, and picking up on many of the, uh, the great themes here. I'd just love to hear really your vision for the ALA and what do you think libraries should be doing in this great moment? Um, and as you prepare for that, I just want to say one thing to, to Crosby Kemper, who in the last session, who uh, was talking about having 100 young people go up to the governor's office. I believe that his daughter was actually one of those who went with him and, and got thrown out. So I think he's an excellent parent uh, in, in, as well as a library advocate uh, in that respect. But um, Tracy, as, as we think about what does it mean to be advocates in this moment? What's the vision that you think we should be advocating for? What, what are the next steps we should all take? Uh, over to you. Thank you so much, John. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I wish I could have been here for the entire conversation, but the parts that I was able to listen to, I think just tee us up so well for, for this conversation. I really want to agree, of course, that this is a 911 rather than a 411 issue. But I, I want to say that this is, while we do need to watch the clock, this is not an issue. Uh, digital literacy, digital access is not a new issue for libraries. Um, I think that uh, we we definitely want to heed um, the call to action, and I want to get to that in, in just a minute, but I, I want to argue that um, libraries, uh, school and public libraries, and to some degree, I think, uh, uh, post-secondary libraries were really critical um, in introducing um, personal computing um, to a public, and I just don't want to ignore that because I think that we have a precedent for that. I can think back to my days at Seattle Public Library in courses teaching teaching um, people who worked on fishing boats um, in Seattle who would drive their pickup truck from some part of uh, the United States only to find out that that uh, sort of shanty where people could go and, and get on a boat, as they would call it, um, was now a website. And that was the first time that they'd heard of such and they needed um, to have access. I think that type of digital instruction um, followed, of course, um, Hartford Public Library. I remember being in there, uh, being there and opening up one of the first 21st century labs, um, teaching people in that particular Afro-Caribbean community um, how to utilize uh, uh, computers because many of the available jobs were moving from light industry and even agricultural jobs um, to um, as administrative jobs in, in insurance companies in Connecticut. So when we talk about this, I just want to posit, this is not new for libraries, but I do, I do think that this is um, something that will require a federated approach. And that's what I really want to talk about. I want to talk about the opportunity, I think, to launch a national campaign with local demonstration projects. And I, I will stop there. But again, um, I, I want to also underscore something that I think uh, Crosby was adding to the conversation. The issue is not just digital access. It's also about digital literacy. And it means that, um, and I've been saying this for a long time, we cannot talk about digital access and only talk about broadband because that's like talking about cereal with no milk. The reality, the thing that is going to um, make this a reality and to ground this conversation is looking at um, the role that libraries play in adult literacy and in formal and informal adult education. So I think I'm launching a couple of things there and we can keep moving. Tracy, thank you. I love the cereal and milk. I would imagine maybe there's some Americans who need some fruit on there too for to be really, really healthy. And 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 I think we've been giving too much just cereal alone. Um, and I do think your part of your advocacy and your wonderful vision for the moment is to expand that in, in ways that really are about abundance and about what we really need to provide to all Americans to thrive in this uh, in this moment. Um, but I wonder if you could just go go a little more precisely in, in speaking to this moment. Where where would you like to see both funders and librarians create these networks and coalitions that people have been talking about what what's the what's the really specific opportunity here do you think in this moment with all this money flowing and this focus um, hopefully toward a more equitable and inclusive recovery 
Well, one thing for sure is I think that we will miss the possibility of this moment if we do not allow ourselves to focus on generational poverty. I think that libraries in particular um, across the gamut, tribal libraries, special libraries, academic, public libraries, school libraries, um, I think that we, we know that we have, especially in the last 20 years, re that much of the concentrated use or the super use in libraries um, is, is really about seeing um, the lowest paid workers um, and their families, um, as well as uh, people of color using libraries and sometimes using libraries at, um, at rates that are comparatively much higher um, than their white and wealthier peers. Um, we also know that, um, Today, it persists that the major determinant of, of poverty is um, head of household poverty, right? And that is what persists. So I think that we have an opportunity here. Um, I should say that is what is passed on. Um, I think we have an opportunity here to, to, to focus on, um, on head of households, especially low income head of households who are the most likely to be um, displaced permanently or in the long term because of um, moving more of um, our more of our goods and services moving to um, hybrid environments or solely remote environments. So what happens to those workers? I think the second piece um, that we have an opportunity to focus on is um, because of because of the fact that right now we know that the major determinants of um, the major determinants of quality of, of life long term are of course access to education access to employment and access uh, to public health. And, and each of those three areas are now largely mediated in online environments, right? So I think we also have an opportunity to focus on where we have seen the largest gaps during the pandemic. And, and those are, they don't bear uh, repeating, but I just want to mention in terms of a national campaign where we would need to focus first. And that is, of course, dense urban environments where we have an overage of, um, of public housing and subsidized housing. Um, secondly, obviously, we need to focus on poor rural communities across the country. Third, and this is something that um, I think that we are seeing more and more um, come, come to play out, is that we have to focus on largely BIPOC or ALANA, whatever your acronym is, um, heavily people of color, um, suburbs where we have seen more recent white flight, but where we have also seen aging, um, decaying or missing um, social infrastructure. And then lastly, we have to focus on tribal communities as well as um, services and access to people who are incarcerated. So when I think about those five areas, um, both that are actual physical geographies um, as well as political geographies, um, that is where I think we we need to work first because if we, and only libraries, I think, libraries are uniquely, I think, um, um, dispositioned to reach each of those communities effectively. So I think that, that those are the areas where we really need to focus and I think that we must start now. So Tracy, it makes a lot of sense and, and I think this set of five uh, focus areas and communities that allows for kind of a strategy that is that is targeted, right? And it does, it's not everything for everybody in a, in a moment where if we go for everything for everybody, you know, we won't get enough, right? It, it, the, the opportunity to be lost. Um, I heard Diane Rasmussen in the last panel um, from Alaska say that if you're a librarian and you are not on the front lines of this fight, you should fire yourself. Right. Um, I wonder if you could kind of build on that. And and Diane, of course, is a funder, not a, a lib library leader. You are you actually have been and are both. Um, when you are in front of your members uh, and urging them to get into the streets, get into the uh, governor's offices and, and city halls and so forth, what precisely do you want said in those moments as part of this campaign? Is it focused on this ARP money, this potentially future infrastructure bill kind of money? What's the, what is the, the, um, the message that goes along with those five target areas that you've uh, set forth and this expanded vision of what a library could be and what, what kind of access really means? Right. So, so one thing I have to say is that I can't be on, on um, in a day that features people like uh, Felton Thomas or or Jill Bourne, um, both of whom I have long history with, and and not and not mention the fact that I think that libraries um, are, I think, as 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 have become as sophisticated. Um, um, and library leaders have become as sophisticated as any civic leader. I think that one of the things I would say in terms of being able to talk 
um, win friends, you know, to influence friends, win friends and influence people. I think we see that because I, I know that ALA launched a mighty, a mighty push to make sure that libraries were included in ARPA. And although I'm not the bragging type, I, I, I don't want to, I, I can't, we can't say that without saying that even the American Library Association has been extremely sophisticated, um, working with, um, working with um, um, our, 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 our Congressman um, um, Levin and Reed, ensuring that they were touring libraries, ensuring that they understood um, the, the reach that libraries have. So I, I think the, the thing that I, I want to allow is I think there's an old trope about libraries. And, I, and I'm here to bust it because the reason why I'm, I'm back in libraries is because working in philanthropy, working um, especially at the level of community investment, I was always feeling like um, libraries were left out of the conversation and here they were hidden in plain sight. People would talk about adult education. They would even talk about food insecurity, those kinds of things. They would talk about access to e-government. And I would always say, Where, where's libraries in this conversation? So I'm here to say that I think that um, I want to I want to end the old trope that libraries are not sophisticated and that librarians and library leaders are not sophisticated. I do think, though, that the conversation has come around to where libraries can lead and we are ready. But what we have to do is that we have to build a federated campaign that links national policy as well as boots on the ground in each geography across this country. And, I, and it isn't as simple as working on a state level. It isn't as simple as working city to city. It is about understanding these geopolitical um, entities and how do we make sure that, that we look at their realities and we connect based on their needs. So I think that this is library's time. And I, I think that the American Library Association, you know, uh, John Bracken and, and I have talked a lot about DIPLA. I think that we have um, entities that are ready, um, that, that have the, the people power. And I think that this is not about, for ALA, we've been saying a lot, we're, I'm not interested in, in members. I'm interested in movement building. And, and again, what I, if I say nothing else, what the nut that we have to crack right now is generational poverty. That is, that is something that we talk nicely about, we racialize, but we haven't done anything about it. In fact, the most vulnerable, economically vulnerable communities are all sliding backwards. So I think that when we have this conversation, every entity, any philanthropy that's interested in thinking about poverty, systemic, long-term generational poverty, they have to understand the unique position of libraries to actually disrupt and do something in that space. I love that, Tracy. It makes perfect sense. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the big DPLA night announcement uh, earlier. Um, but before I ask that question, uh, you, you invoked, of course, Jill and Felton and these other great uh, library uh, leaders, inspirational individuals. I wonder if um, just extrapolating from individuals to other networks and movements out there, when you think about the movement that you're hoping to inspire here in this moment, this campaign, that would link up your national leadership and the kind of national leadership that Felton and Joe and others can can get going with the grassroots across the country, the hundred uh, you know um, high school students that Crosby brings into the, the the governor's office. Are there movements? Are there uh, are there networks out there that you uh, look to and and might draw inspiration from? And people are thinking about analogies, or is this a totally new thing? It's got to be you know a, a brand new brand new playbook here. Oops, you might be on mute though for a sec. Sorry about that. I'm so glad you asked that question because I there are community level networks um, that exist across the country, and I'll just give you an example. I don't want to I don't want to call uh, one out at the risk of 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 not calling out another. But I will say historically, I remember right right after Katrina, I happened to be working at the American Library Association for the first time, um, and we. We we went into um, we went into New Orleans because we knew um, that we needed to do some work on the ground um, in Treme and in the Ninth Ward um, because we were we were getting some calls from librarians and and actually trustees in those areas feeling like those libraries might not come online for a very long time. Same with some work that ALA right now is doing in Kentucky um, and. 
Uh, and so when, when we went in, the, the partners were, of course, the library system, but also the local community networks, um, especially networks that exist around public health um, information, e-government, um, et cetera. And so I think that there are um, sort of small constellations of networks across the country that we have to sort of join into, into sort of um, one larger system. And I think that's what we have the, the opportunity to, to do. Some are based around, of course, just standard informatics and, and traditional library and information services, but some are specifically um, uh, oriented around public health uh, access, um, food insecurity, um, employment and employability. When I was coming in, somebody was talking about workforce. That's something that um, uh, adult education, but all of those things are places where I think libraries have um, developed partnerships, ongoing partnerships, and where we, I think we have uh, ready adjacencies and an opportunity to build big um, right, right out the door. That's awesome, Tracy. I think it's very heartening to think about the fact that we have examples. ALA has had examples. All of us have been involved in examples. This is not a totally new thing. What we do have is a great moment, and we have your incredible energy and leadership and, and the incredible energy and leadership of Felton and Jill and others who are, you know, in their full stride right now, right, in, in the library moment. Um, in that same spirit, you mentioned our mutual friend, uh, John Bracken. We've also been, of course, listening to George Martinez all day long from Knight Foundation, and uh, they have a big announcement today with Lyricists about um, the Palace Project and, and uh, eBooks and so forth. I wonder if you had any comments on, on that, uh, that announcement today and, and any thoughts around ALA and its role here um, in, in, this, uh, in this big moment. Well, I'm de I really want to. I really want to applaud. I think um, the the work that's being done, and I also want to say that I'm a student. I'm really learning from from people like like John Bracken, um, because where I think um, I think we as those of us who work in the library space, I think one thing that we have to 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 learn is that we we need to. We need to not only be at the table, but we need to make sure that we have a seat and a part of the decision making, even around funding. Because even as the funding is coming out, ostensibly that could support libraries, it's not going to come to go to libraries unless we make that actually happen. And people like to dismiss libraries. We almost have to kind of focus on public health. And we have to do, I think, what public health did. There was this idea that people thought about community health or community nursing or those kinds of things almost as if they were spaces where other people could, could act on or do something to or decision make for. I think for libraries, we have to own our power, own the fact that we have um, trusted relationships, own that we sometimes go into um, spaces in community that others don't see, that we work with individuals that others may not know by name, but we know that person in the entire family, understand that we are the inventors of informatics. We have invented informatics, the, the placing of technology um, in the hands of the public um, to, to fit and meet their needs. So I think the sophistication of partnerships that John and DIPLA, um, DPLA, um, I think sort of represent, those are the things that I, I, I'm learning from and I wanna put at the disposal of libraries. I wanna make sure that the next big announcement about support um, in this area, about cracking um, the nut of generational poverty that I think is sort of the bane of existence um, for, for a country like ours, that we would have this level of disparity, ongoing disparity in terms of household income and the way it impacts housing, the way that it impacts education, employment, all of those things. I think that if we can follow uh, sort of, I think the, the template that's being set, I think that libraries will be in, in the best position ever um, to finally and firmly deal with this issue of, of the ways in which access to information, digital access, and digital instruction can intervene on generational poverty. I love that, Tracy. Thank you. And I know that the uh, the audience here, like me, we could listen to you all day long. I know you also have a very hard stop in a minute. Um, but any any last words for the uh, for the audience before uh, before we turn it over to George Martinez, who has slipped into my screen with his hook in hand? But I want you to be sure to have the have the last word, Tracy. Well, I'm going to take a, I'm going to, I'm seeing uh, something in chat from one of my dear colleagues, Kelvin Watson, and he says, yes, community builders. So I just want to take this opportunity, John, to thank you. I want to thank Knight. I, I would definitely want to thank you, George and, and John Bracken for, for this platform. I, and I just want to say to all of the librarians um, and, and library advocates um, who have presented today, let's move boldly. 
Audre Lorde says, she says, I'm bold and I'm afraid of nothing. This is our time. But I do think like Diane says, if we don't seize this moment or we allow ourselves to be backed into a corner, if we don't uh, connect the dots between broadband and the kind of digital instruction and digital access that happens in libraries, then we will be remiss. Let's move forward. Let's create a national program, a national initiative that links libraries of all types. Let's create demonstration projects in the areas that we know need it the most. And let's start today. Wow, fantastic. Incredible. All right. I, we can't uh, let thanks everybody. Thanks, Tracy. Let's go. Let's go, people. And George, over to you. How you what, what, what are we gonna do? Uh, I'm I'm ready to go. I'm charged up. Let's go. And I just, uh, you know, you know, I do want to ask a question to Tracy, though. You brought up an interesting point. The money's out there. Do you think that instead of maybe going to, uh, you know, the state, some of the money in ARPA that was completely targeted for libraries should have gone directly to IMLS or organizations that fund libraries directly? George, I promised Tracy that she could leave at 55 minutes, just saying. I've promised her she got yes. a hard stop at 55 minutes. So she might need to, this might be our sequel meeting. Okay. Yes, well, one thing I'll say, cause I, I do need to leave, but I, um, I wanna say one thing that I think is really important. I think that we have an opportunity to um, have maybe one of the most profound public private partnerships that we could ever imagine. That is a, a, a group of funders who work with, uh, who work with, I think, departments, um, federal departments. IMLS has, has been supported and, 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 and that's a great investment. That's, that's important. But we have to think outside of the library space. We're talking about labor. We're talking about education. We're talking about departments of justice, et cetera. So I'm going to leave you with that. But I want to say to my colleagues who are listening, you all, this is the moment. Those of us who came into, into libraries when many of my peers are here, this is the moment that we have been waiting for. Seed nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And Thanks, uh, thank you for your time, Tracy. Thank John, you, John, always a pleasure. Thank you for, for moderating this. Really appreciate it and for sharing our thoughts uh, with the group as well. Um, you know, this Bring us been, home, George, bring us home. I'm trying, dude, I'm trying. Uh, this has been fantastic. I really do want to thank everybody that's participated in this. Uh, you know, Jill Bourne, uh, Juliet Fink Jates, Jenny Slap. Uh, Felton Thomas, Andrew McLaughlin, Diane Kaplan, Crosby, Kemper, uh, you know, Greg Lucas, and of course, Alberti Bargwin, and Tracy Hall, and, you know, John, thank you so much for all your time. This has been incredibly powerful. And, uh, you know, I wish we had more time because, I, I mean, I know there are a lot of questions out there and I have lots of questions. Yep. And, you know, the good thing is we're going to hope to, to continue these conversations. We, you know, in the next three or four months, sometimes in the, in the fall, we're going to have another one of these. Maybe the opportunity is to really dive deep into some of, dive deeper into some of these questions, maybe examine where things have occurred, how things have moved. There's so many opportunities to look at this stuff. Yep. I also want to thank- And just, George, just to highlight, because a lot of people asked questions that we didn't get to in the Q&A, we, the night team has captured those questions. We're going to come back and answer those. And specifically around the PALS project, we're holding time on July 7th to, do, to host a webinar to um, answer questions around the PALS project. So that link is it's either, you know, someone will throw it in the chat or someone will tweet it out, but July 7th in the afternoon. Um, well, I don't know about we'll get, the, if you've got the link for the July 7th. I've got about the discussion today, go ahead. Now I do have, I just put the link up for the palaceproject.org. Hopefully there, there'll be information there. Um, I do, you know, as we wrap this up, I do also want to thank, you know, you, John, for all the great work you did, um, Michelle Kimpton, and, and of course, Robert Miller from Lyricist. I'm really excited of the work that, uh, that they're going to be doing, and it looks excited to see what comes out of that, and with you as well, John, and DPLA. Um, thank you for your leadership and your help with putting together this conference. And, you know, to everybody out there, you know, as, as some of these ideas come to you, you know, please don't be afraid to share them with John, myself. Um, you know, we're really interested in, in what the future is for libraries and how organizations 
like Knight Foundation could help be assistance? I mean, it's obviously there's a lot of great ideas and very little time and very little money, unfortunately, out there. We, the hardest part is always saying no to great ideas, but you know, we'd like to hear because sometimes maybe I know some other organization that is doing some work and you know we also on here we have other incredible funders that that you uh saw on the panels and others that you didn't hear from you know doran webb from from sloan has been a great partner and funder of libraries for many years um you know we we sort of talk among each other once in a while and and maybe ideas that aren't right for us like you know could be right for somebody else but you know don't be shy let us know um, and George, we have to thank, I mean, one, thanks to Knight Foundation, the Palace Project is going to be really exciting. Watch watch the internet for more coming on that. Um, and thank you to you and to Lyricist for partnering with that. And I want to give a huge thank you to Jackie, Justin, Phil, uh, and Raul on the Knight side. This meeting doesn't happen. Special extra thanks to Jackie, who's really made this entire thing happen while in two or three yes. different jobs at Knight Foundation. Um, so... You know, we'll we'll see you soon in the fall. We I I'm shocked and surprised that a hundred of you showed up during this holiday time, uh, and we're gonna keep keep the conversation going. Thank John, you, John. What's your email address in case somebody has to talk to you? Bracken at dp.la, and I'm JSB on the on Twitter. Bracken at dp.la. My email is easy. Martinez at at kf.org. Thank you, everybody. Look forward to seeing you again soon. And, uh, you know, keep fighting the good fight. Take care.